I just want to thank the uh, organizers and uh, Mort and Swami and uh, to invite me to this wonderful meeting, educational meeting, and to meet colleagues from uh, the other part of the world. And also to thank them for giving me such a sadistic title as uh, is follicular lymphoma curable for 20 minutes. Okay. I think that what I'd like to say to you is uh, continuing, is follicular lymphoma curable? Well, the pessimists in those individuals will be say no, and I was going to sit down. But I thought, nah, that's too quick. How about we're going to say the optimist, yes. I gave it some thought, and I said, hmm, I think I'm going to stick with my last, maybe. And I'm going to give you information, maybe supporting this, and we're going to go back and revisit this same slide at the end of my talk. So a little bit of background, some uh, approach to treatment of advanced stage follicular lymphomas, some accepted historical facts, the rapidly changing terrain, who and when to treat, um, why treat patients, what are our goals, what treatment to use, are cures possible, and where are we now and where are we going. So some characteristics of follicular lymphoma to keep in mind is that it is an indolent clinical course typically. It is highly responsive to therapy, but relapse is likely that treatment decisions, as we all know, that treat lymphomas is based on multiple things, not just one issue, but the stage, the bulk of the tumor, our patients having areas of transformation. Flippy should be implemented since we all can gain that information from our clinical data. Um, what sites are involved, uh, the prior therapy, and how long did the patient respond to that prior therapy? And the current treatment approach, and I'm not trying to convince anybody what the right answer is, because I don't think we have one formula for all patients with follicular lymphoma, include frontline therapy we know is right now rituximab, plus either by itself in good risk patients, plus chemotherapy in advanced stage. Which chemo? There's a list we can pick from, but I believe in general R plus chemo is the right answer for most uh, symptomatic patients. Consolidation is not that straightforward. We'll be talking about that uh, in some of my slides, whether it's rituximab, radioimmunotherapy based recently on the FIT trial from Europe, or possibly other agents, which I think uh, we should be investigating. And then salvage therapy or whatever we didn't choose for the induction or chemo, um, but also consideration for uh, patients with high risk disease or early relapses, consideration for stem cell transplant, also considering that radioimmunotherapy is FDA approved for that indication. What are historical facts? That follicular lymphoma, we're taught as fellows, and as we go through this, this, uh, uh, this, this travels, we'll say, in, uh, in cancer therapy, that it's incurable. And that initiation treatment soon after diagnosis in asymptomatic patients doesn't change their outcome, therefore you might as well wait till the patients become symptomatic. That treatment is sequential. Save your aggressive therapy for later. Use gentle therapy up front. And again, let me just put clearly is that I believe that that's all true in the old uh, historical approach when we did not have the type of tools that we have today. The number of novel agents, targeted agents, less toxic agents than just general chemotherapy that had a lot of nonspecific toxicity and also did not give us as good of a, a potential cell kill as what we have available to us today. The also other facts are the palliation of symptoms, not trying to cure patients, just palliate patients were okay, that a PR was as good as a complete remission. That transformation was independent of the type or timing of treatment, which I don't think there's any hard data for, but there is some data suggesting on retrospective review that those patients getting a more aggressive regimen, including potentially anthracyclines, may have a lower risk of transformation. This still has to be proved in, in, in prospective studies. And then general, the median overall survival was only eight to 10 years. Well, what about principle of therapies today? Well, generally we still believe, many people believe it's incurable with conventional approaches. That observation is appropriate and when there are no indications for therapy, but I think that this is not universally accepted now. A number of studies are looking at potentially even using uh, monotherapy, rituxan monotherapy, in good risk patients who historically would have been watched and waited, now may be benefited from getting intervening intervention early. And recent publications, rewardingly for us, have not only showed an improvement in progression-free survival, but also an overall survival. And I think very important, we should always keep in mind that if we have feasible or good clinical trials, 
these patients should be enrolled because we have so many novel agents. In order for us to learn which will be optimal, they should be going on clinical trials. This slide is taken from a, a paper from JCO demonstrating the SWOC studies over many decades. And what basically showed is a CHOP with or without a, an adjuvant compared to PROMACE, but then the addition of antibody, whether it's cold CD20 or hot CD20 with I131 tocitumab, also called Bexar, really made a dramatic difference with respect to overall survival, not only progression-free, but overall survival, changing four-year survivals from 70 to 80 percent with chemo alone up to 90 percent in four-year. And other data actually suggests, I've seen from uh, Stanford, that patients now, there's an estimate that there may be, from the earlier uh, data points, up to 17 years is the median overall survival with patients with, uh, 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 with follicular lymphoma. I thought this was interesting when I was viewing this uh, data, is that uh, it's interesting to note that normal individuals can have 14, 18 translocation uh, in their actual uh, peripheral blood that can be measured but they're, basically these are healthy individuals, they do not have lymphoma, that these naive B cells will have actually increased BCL2 protein, and potentially with either autoantigens or do say in a condition of some literature in a viral stimulation, can actually have a germinal center reaction, go into the germinal center, and actually if there is a, a follicular dendritic cell and a B and T cell together, these cells actually can become memory B cells. Now that's not enough. These can be now a pre-follicular lymphoma, but in the setting of uh, further oncogenic hits, this can actually transform into true follicular lymphoma. What I thought interesting when reviewing this data is that there actually is some information that these uh, BCL2 positive B cells, not yet follicular lymphoma, and a patient with hepatitis C, if you treat the virus hepatitis C and eradicate it, these B1418 cells go away. And in some cases actually reported that when the hepatitis C came back, there was a reoccurrence of these cells. So it makes it interesting to think that if the microenvironment in normal, up to 50 percent or more of individuals may have these type of 14, 18 positive B cells, maybe we won't be able to cure follicular lymphoma because eventually with additional hits from our environmental exposures, these may be always present and ready to become a follicular lymphoma in a high percentage of patients. Well, let's look at the changing landscape. Heterogeneity and complexity, as we heard from uh, Dr. Winters in large cell, also play, applies to follicular lymphomas. But we're developing new scientific tools to look at the biological, genetic, and clinical features that are different between these patients. Uh, we know already with, uh, for expect, uh, patients have follicular lymphoma grade 1, 2, 3A, or 3B and we are still learning. Now, targeted therapies and novel treatment approaches, as I mentioned, improving disease for an overall survival. And I think we have to review and, and rethink what our historical approaches have been to the treatment of follicular lymphomas. For example, what is the optimal combinations of old and new agents, optimal timing and sequencing, and what are the surrogate endpoints of overall survival? Because all of us will be dead in the room if we do a big study and wait for overall survival, which is good for patients, but not so good for us. Why treat follicular lymphoma and what are the goals? Now, is it palliation only? Or are there optimists here to say that maybe we actually can cure the patient, but we need to go outside the box and outside of a historical teachings in order to apply some new ideas? So if the definition of a cure means that we're going to get rid of all follicular lymphoma cells forever, maybe this is not achievable based on what I mentioned before about maybe these BCL2 positive normal B cells. But if we can't do that, then optimal palliation, where we're giving patients therapy that they don't have symptoms from their disease, and that we can alternate therapy so they don't develop resistance, and they can live to 105, I think that's the next best option, and that may be possible. So, but if we really want to talk about curing follicular lymphoma, I think that we have to think about cure meaning both nodal and molecular complete remissions. So without a true complete remission, though, if you don't have that to start with, we're never going to talk about curing patients. So the first step is uh, the best quality complete remission that we can attain in these patients. I just wanted to show these are indications for treatment on a clinical uh, trial. For example, this is the beta-mustine rituxan versus R-CHOP 
trial will revisit that in a few minutes. But these are indications. This is what happens. You have a patient that has disease, but this is what's been historically attached and have been applied. So the patient needs one or more of the following. B symptoms, hematopoietic failure is listed, large tumor burden, three lymph node areas of five centimeters or one area greater than seven and a half, rapid progression or complications due to disease. So I think this needs to be reexamined. And I think these patients already by this time are behind and able to push them to the, against the, the corner. And basically, they're incurable already at this point. However, if they come to see the clinician earlier, I think that we need to revisit maybe we should treat these patients earlier on when they have less bulky disease, less of a chance to have more heterogeneity. Thinking about what happens with transformed follicular lymphomas, it doesn't transform everywhere in the body. It's where those additional hits occur that those patients transform. So I think this is a living organism that if we take patients with less disease before they go to higher stage flippy or more bulky disease, that we probably would have better outcomes. And probably not just, I know that some people say it's just lead bias, but I don't believe it's going to be all truly just lead bias because the majority of patients you watch and wait, within two to three years, half of them need therapy anyway. So what about the new directions of follicular lymphoma? We know the success of antibodies, but I think there's a paradigm shift in the attitudes. That therapeutic goals are moving away from just palliation, but we are now trying to achieve in all of our studies getting prolonged remission duration, at least the first step, and potentially cure. That we're not just doing watchful waiting, but we're also going to more aggressive upfront therapies, and we're developing and testing novel immunoconjugates and targeted therapies. So I think that I actually predict that not only are we improving now, we're seeing patients with respect to response and overall survival, but we will get cures. So what is the optimal treatment presentation of relapse? It's easy. I don't know. And I'm not sure we'll, we'll find out. I think we need to work at it, and we will find that in subgroups of patients, certain therapies should be given, but we need to keep working at clinical trials. We need additional information about the optimal sequencing and the choice of therapy, as I mentioned. Tumor characteristics need to be involved. Clinical and laboratory characteristics is listed in addition patient characteristics. I think all three are very important so that when we develop clinical trials and we participate, we need to gain information on patients, not just clinical data, but we also need to require biopsies to be done in patients and then stored so that we can do at least tissue, protein microarrays, but very importantly also as we're learning, we should be doing, uh, looking at gene expression profiling and the microenvironment. These things have been overlooked. We used to be that one shoe fit all. That's not the case anymore as we're getting more sophisticated in our knowledge of these diseases. So basically what's needed, we need to look at inclusion, exclusion, correlate prognostic factors, and use, actually it's interesting, there's been a couple publications using frontline therapies that achieve high complete remission rates first line actually shows that these CR rates actually give us the longest remission duration. So I think that there's a little bit of a revolutionary concept. The choice of initial therapy may be critical in follicular lymphoma. Not just palliation, not just putting a patch on it, but going for a complete remission up front. What are the benefits of targeted therapies? Less nonspecific toxicities. You can target resistance pathways. I'll show you some examples. Non-cross resistance, very important. In the old days, we didn't have so many tools that if you kept giving the same agent, you would develop resistance, and responses were less and less. They were less durable. I think also it's very clear that we're getting synergy and additive effects. We're using these biological or targeted agents with less, without additional significant toxicity given to the patients while in therapy. And the clinical trials are very exciting. This was from my friend Sven DeVos from UCLA. I just want to demonstrate, I can't go over all the details in such a short period of time, but I want to gain an appreciation that we have a number of places that we can work on. Not only surface markers here, we know about CD20, but we have second generation CD20 that have different epitopes and actually different biological activity. There are also CD19 and importantly CD22 conjugates. The interesting thing about 19 and 22 is that when that antibody binds to the surface of the cell, whatever is targeted with those antibodies are internalized, whether it's drug conjugates or it's radioisotopes like yttrium-90 or if it's toxin. So I think this is a whole new area here. The microenvironment, letalidomide, we'll be mentioning in a few minutes, and, or bevacizumab, looking at angiogenesis of the tumor, 
different chemo agents, in particular betamustine, and different pathways with respect to protosome inhibition, HDAC inhibition, and I think one of the most important ones in the bottom there is the B-cell receptor signaling pathway, which I think is underestimated and will make, have a major impact with respect to these drugs developed in there. I just want to mention a couple studies. Uh, the PRIMA study, which looks at getting patients, they were randomized, they had untreated, they had advanced stage and uh, somewhat bulky or uh, uh, high tumor burden disease. They got either RCVP, RCHOP, or FCM, or MCP, and got randomized that they had a response to either rituximab or Mabthera, one dose every two months for 24 months or observation. The bottom line was remembering this is high tumor burden, not patients maybe with less tumor burden that many people actually in the States treat, and that these patients did show about a 15% difference with progression-free survival. However, this is not overall survival, it's progression-free survival, and some of these patients actually relapse in this group that just had observations. Well, many of these patients don't need therapy. We can treat these patients. They may have just a one and a half, two centimeter node, and those patients can be observed. I often don't treat those patients. The questions that I think that really need to be asked are a couple points is that PRIMA study does not allow to uh, evaluate an effect on overall survival or response to second or subsequent therapy. A lot of exposure to rituximab runs the risk of developing rituxan resistance. And also, what about the costs about doing a trial like this? So the question is, if you give upfront rituximab maintenance, what about second, third line? Are we going to give maintenance every time we give therapy? And how much is enough? And what is the timing I'll bring up? But there's not so many other novel agents that we can be testing and to see if actually we can improve on those results. The questions in follicular lymphoma still that need to be studied with rituximab is what's the optimal scheduled dose and duration of our maintenance? What are the biological factors that determine sensitivity and resistance to it? And there's also adverse events to having chronic CD20 depletion. This is just to show you what are the different types of maintenance schedules that are utilized. You can see for yourself there's a whole slew of them. Who knows what are the best? And the other question is why do we start maintenance right away after we complete often patients who get rituxan chemo, they have depleted immune systems. There's probably the immunoeffector cells don't recover for maybe several months after completion of chemo. Maybe there should be a delay. So which schedule is best? Is it more really better? And retreatment versus maintenance. What about taking one thing that was missing in the Prima study? What if we just waited for patients to relapse and just gave them four doses of rituximab again and see if they actually had a response? That's one part of the study that I think would have been very important if it would have been included. So what about clinical problems, about prolonged B cell suppression? Yes, rituxan in general is safe when given as part of the induction therapy, but in patients, there are some studies now going out five years or indefinitely suppressing CD20 positive B cells. And reviewing the literature, I presented that at ASCO last year, um, I reviewed the literature, and these are some of the possibilities with prolonged B cell suppression. Hypogammy globulinemia has been uh, demonstrated. Delayed neutropenia, which is recoverable in most patients, but viral reactivation in particular, worrying about patients developing PML. Increased infections, including sinopulmonary uh, infections. Response, uh, restricted responsiveness to vaccinations. And patients getting resistance. Let's change a few more topics because I'm, time is running out. Radiotherapy is underestimated, and I don't think it, we appreciate it as much as when being one of the most powerful single agents that we can be utilizing with respect to the treatment of patients with low-grade lymphoma. It combines not only the immunotherapy component, but internal, I call it radiotherapy, and the difference between the naked and the radio-labeled antibodies, radio-labeled antibodies have a crossfire effect. So in addition to not only targeting those cells that have, for example, CD20, the cells that may have low expression or negative for that target antigen can still get a crossfire and be killed. Now, I think that I mentioned CD22 is internalized. This is, we should be watching this also. This is an atuzumab, ozigomycin. I don't know why they named these things like this. CMC 544, we did work with this at Roswell and other institutions. We see that CD22, and this is interesting because it's an IgG4, it has no biological activity. It's used to deliver colichomycin. It's the same agent that was in Mylotarg. And it's actually interesting, it has shown positive results not only alone, but in combination with rituximab. And the idea is that with CD22, this is not doing any biological activity, it's a delivery service. It's bringing that agent to the lymphoma cell, internalizing what it binds, and using its activity. 
But amastine is getting a lot of press, and I can be honest with you, it's exciting and it's interesting at the same time. But amastine being around 20 years ago in East Germany has both an alkylating and a, a purine al alkylator type of uh, um, combination in its structure. It's believed that the purine alkylating type alkylator does not contribute to its bile or its activity, anti-tumor activity, that this is really a super alkylating agent. And it's interesting because even patients who had significant exposure both to alkylators and or to uh, purine analogs still have significant activity. And what's interesting, it's believed to cause mitotic catastrophe. I thought that's a kind of a neat term, mitotic catastrophe. But it does work in a number of patients, even with very um, significantly relapsed refractory low-grade uh, lymphoproliferative disorders. I just showed the same conditions, RCHOP versus betamustine rituxan. These are the indications. I think it would be interesting that as part of our work that we do, we should actually look at published papers. And I think it's important we do subset analyses to see that in some patients, maybe certain uh, uh, reasons to treat patients maybe one arm versus another arm may be more optimal. I think we need to be looking at this more carefully. I just wanted to show you some of the data that there's an improvement in complete response rates with BR in immediate progression-free survival and the time to the next treatment. Now, the only questions I have from the beta rituxan arm, will it replace or has it already replaced in the United States the upfront therapy for follicular lymphoma? It's replaced RCHOP, RCVP. And a large groups, when they've done studies in uh, uh, different... Uh, uh, basically telephones and uh, called and inquired, a lot of physicians are using this in a community. But we should remind, remind ourselves a few things. They did it in follicular grade one and two. Grade three histologies were not included in the trial. And it was weird that I've heard this from Dr. Rummel, is that their PR and CR patients have identical outcomes, unusual, unless that a lot of these PRs are actually um, complete remissions. And that brings in the idea maybe just maybe, and we have some trials that are being done, we should be using PET scans to see if a number of these patients really are complete remissions, just have residual adenopathy. We need a, for, a formal peer-reviewed publication. It has not been published yet in two years. I'm not sure what the uh, delay is, but I think it's important that once it gets published, we critically review it. A long-term follow-up is a concern about patients that may have difficulty maybe collecting stem cells in some of these patients, but that has to be answered still in the future. Let alinamide, just to mention, exciting because it's multiple mechanisms of action. It's not limited to just one target. It has target to the, directly to the tumor cell, to the stromal cell, anti-angiogenesis, stimulation of the cellular immunity, but also augmenting, uh, augmenting NK, T, uh, NK cells. In our lab, we studied it and found that NK cells with rituximab was responsible for synergistic activity in a mouse animal model of human lymphoma, because when we knocked out the T cells, we lost the synergistic activity. And we're studying this in patients in Fowler at MD Anderson, demonstrated that the combination of rituximab and Revlimid has dramatic activity in the upfront setting, where patients even 90% response rate in three quarters of those patients being complete remissions. Now we're studying the durability and additional studies will be done, but it actually may be changing the treatment paradigm even further compared to just using, say, rituxan and other standard chemos. We heard earlier from Jane about Velcade, abortizumib, proteasome inhibition. Very exciting. There is studies in follicular lymphoma showing improvement or activity. I think we should also keep in mind that they're second generation. Proteasome inhibitors we're studying in the lab. Actually, they have similar, if not maybe somewhat augmented anti-tumor activity, but without a significant amount of neurotoxicity. Very exciting avenues. Epigenetics, I just want to mention the DAC, the acetylase or HDAC inhibitors. In particular, it's fascinating because they may allow um, tumor suppressor genes to be transcribed and translated, and we see anti-tumor activity. A little bit of a black box. I don't know if we're going to have a biomarker for this, but I think some of the most exciting data you're going to be seeing in the near future is using an HDAC inhibitor plus a proteasome inhibitor. In our laboratory, we've seen dramatic activity, not only in sensitive but rituxan-resistant cell lines and in patient samples when we look at it ex vivo. What about idiotype vaccines? I just want to mention a couple other things. This was a real, real excitement generated in the last, say, last decade or more, but we looked at three different studies. There was a genotope, a favoril, and a biovax uh, vaccine, BioVest, uh, originally started with the NCI. None of them actually met their endpoints. What I'm going to say to you is it's exciting, it's an, a fascinating idea that you can take individualized patients, the idiotype off the tumor cell, 
And then with the binding it to KLH as an immunostimulator and giving GM-CSF the injection site, you can immunize a patient forever to be, uh, never have their uh, <coughs> lymphoma recur. It didn't work. I mean, there was some evidence of improvement in progression-free survival, but unfortunately, even in those patients that generated antibodies against the adiotype and even cellular T-cell responses, there were still patients that relapsed. I don't think we should give up on the vaccine approach. I think that as we get additional information and biotechnology further improves, that we're going to revisit this eventually down the line. The last couple slides, apoptosis, I think very important. We have a number of agents now that can be utilized, but in small of acidic and CLL, remarkable results. That this is an undiscovered area. We're going to see a lot more with this and we're going to see this in combination. The B cell receptor signaling, my last uh, important point to make, a number of these agents downstream, B cell receptor sapling, this B cell receptor is stimulated constantly on and actually allows for the survival of the malignant B cell, the neoplastic B cell. If we can block that activity, either, and there's a number of things, these kinases, we know we've heard of SICK before. We know that BTK was presented this last ASH, um, Bruton's tyrosine kinase um, over here, but we also know that PKC gamma, for example, and also PI3 cap of the uh, Cal 101, PI3K, the Cal 101, the uh, delta isoform, we're going to see a lot more of this. And actually, we're going to be starting a trial with Genentech that actually has an antibody against the actual surface B cell receptor that actually has aristatin, the same thing that's on the SGN35 for Hodgkin or anaplastic lymphomas, it'll internalize, and it yet another target for the treatment and for the targeting of lymphoma cells. So the conclusions, well, where are we? We are in an exciting era now of diagnostics, novel diagnostic, prognostics, and therapeutics, and we're really advancing rapidly our understanding of follicular lymphoma, making an impact on over survival, and yes, I believe we may be able to cure a high percentage of patients in the future. The problems are how to best combine these increasing number of active agents. We need a lot more work to get this uh, information. It may not be the same for all subsets of patients. We need well-designed clinical trials. I think one thing that's overlooked, we need longitudinal longer follow-up. Is one therapy then decrease your responsiveness to another therapy? We need to follow these patients. There are some studies looking at that. I think it's very important. And if I had, my, I had a, a genie and I could make one wish, the last thing in the future, I'd like to see this done, a large national or international trial of watchful waiting versus immediate immunochemotherapy clinical trial and advanced stage asymptomatic patients, something like the NIH NCI trial that was done by Longo years ago, to look at whether or not we treat patients when they're asymptomatic and early, do they really do we benefit their overall survival? So last slide, is follicular lymphoma curable? No. Uh, I don't think no is a good answer today. Yes, well, it's an optimist in us, and I think that my answer is going to be, hopefully, stay tuned for the future. Thank you very much for your attention.